good evening to you all. Uh, I am very happy to be here at Fort uh, Kochi as part of uh, RD Archives uh, exhibition uh, on sea a boiling vessel. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to make this uh, presentation. Uh, so I have made uh, a number of uh, presentations on uh, Patanam and uh, in the Roman trade or uh, Indian Ocean trade uh, and uh, so many on maritime history of India. So when they asked me to make this presentation, I thought I would focus on hinterland and uh, maritime exchanges. Uh, hinterland and maritime exchanges of uh, chair and order. Um, uh, then uh, I felt uh, that I could not uh, completely confine to chair and order, so I decided to move on ancient Tamilanam because when we are uh, trying to look at uh, chair and order exclusively, yes, we can do considering Kerala's uh, very unique geographic setting. But uh, if you want to have a holistic understanding, I felt uh, that we need to include ancient Tamilahum. So what I have done in this presentation is to look at the hinterland, the uh, exchanges within uh, Kerala uh, and the ancient Tamilahum and the maritime exchanges. Uh, so uh, often, when we talk about uh, maritime exchanges or maritime trade, we generally focus on long distance trade and uh, foreign connections, exotic uh, connections and uh, we often ignore or at least some of the researchers, they ignore uh, interland uh, exchanges. Uh, when we uh, talk about uh, these hinterland exchanges, there are uh, two kind of uh, hinterland networks. The same network serving two purposes. One hinterland network that supports the internal exchange. Another hinterland network, same network from for uh, from another perspective, supports the long distance exchanges. So, as I said already, my focus is on Cheranadu and uh, ancient Tamilagam. This is the structure of the presentation, introduction and uh, I am talking about the prehistoric period. Mainly, uh, you know, I am focusing on the pre-early historic period, you know what we call as early history. Uh, in Indian history generally we take the period when script was introduced as early history. Uh, as far as uh, southern India is concerned, uh, the beginning of early history is placed conventionally around 300 BCE. Recently based on Kiradi dating, Kiradi in Tamil Nadu they say it can be dated back to 500 BCE. So, uh, we are talking about early historic period starting somewhere between 300 and 500 BC uh, and that is early historic. What I am trying to highlight here uh, is that we need to focus on the period before. I will be showing some of the evidence based on my own research and then I am the, in the end I am moving on to the early historic period interactions. Next. So coming to this uh, cultural formations, I thought I would uh, introduce this slide for mainly for students and the public who may not be familiar uh, with the cultural formations in southern India or ancient Tamil uh, Now there are so many theories on human ancestors and their migrations. Uh, these happened in the much earlier period. Now, I would like to start uh, with the period what is known as Holocene, uh, what is otherwise called as Mesolithic, the hunter-gatherers, uh, who approximately, we are moving to a period called, period say approximately 8000 BCE. 
Uh, it is uh, during this period, southern India, and also we have evidence in Sri Lanka for hunter gatherers occupying from an early period. So, uh, this particular population, uh, I think, is very important. Uh, so called hunter gatherer populations living in different ecological niches of southern India. We often ignore the history of hunter gatherers. We always look for civilizations like Indus civilization or this civilization or that civilization, or we are looking for glories. But uh, in, ha uh, in fact, this. Uh, history of ours started with hunter gatherers occupying in different ecological niches. So in this Mesolithic period, I am sure that people might have exchanged, mainly coastal fishing communities must have exchanged with the hinterland communities. But we don't have uh, evidence because we have not done systematic exploration and excavation of the Mesolithic sites. Next period, which is very clearly understood is Southern Neolithic culture, which dates to 3000 BC. The Southern Neolithic culture was mainly confined to Kerala, uh, sorry, uh, Andhra, Karnataka and some parts of Tamil Nadu. Unfortunately, we do not have much evidence for Southern Neolithic in Kerala. But we have found an important site near Koyambutu, uh, Molapaya. Uh, I will be talking about that site a little later. So this uh, time period uh, of Southern Neolithic is somewhere between 3000 to uh, 1300 BC approximately. It can go little here and there. Uh, then we have something called what is known as Iron Age or Neolithic, which is Iron Age or uh, sorry, Megalithic, which is very well represented in Kerala as well as in other part. So this Iron Age Megalithic is dated to 1300 BCE to 500 BCE and then the early history. So what I am trying to argue is that we need to focus on the interactions in the Southern Neolithic uh, period. So my main focus of uh, today's lecture will be on the period, early history after say 500 or 300 BCE. But there is an important point here we need to highlight, we need to understand. Conventionally, we used to think these cultural historical sequences such as Mesolithic as Southern Neol uh, Neolithic, Iron Age, early historic as exclusive. Uh, in fact, there have been, you know, uh, continuities, continuities of communities in all these periods. So if we had uh, hunter-gatherers in the Mesolithic period, there were hunter-gatherers in the Neolithic, there were hunter-gatherers in the early historic and Iron Age. We have uh, evidence for this in early literature. I will be showing some of these uh, uh, references from early Tamil literature. So, uh, we should see this uh, cultural develop development as pluralistic. It was not unilinear. It's not that, you know, everybody shifted to Neolithic when um, this agro-pastoralism, uh, what is agriculture and uh, animal domestication, when they were introduced. So, some people continue to involve in hunting uh, gathering. So, there was a population diversity. That is what I mean, pluralistic development, what we find in Sangam Tamil texts about mixed economy hunting gathering, pastoralism, cattle pastoralism, or sheep goat pastoralism, all coexisting. And uh, we get to know about this from the references in Sangam literature. And it, that is where the text-based archaeology is very important. When you look at material culture, you get a different perspective. When you look at the literature, you get a different perspective. When you look at the ethnography or anthropological sources, you get different perspectives. That is why I always have been arguing that we should look at history or archaeology as archaeo-anthropo history. Only by uh, connecting all these three different sources, we can get a holistic understanding.
So, uh, as I said, the early Holocene hunters, they were very important and uh, um, coming to this uh, uh, southern Neolithic period, we have evidence of pastoral communities, they were selling milk, produce and millets, then riverine communities exchanging rice and other grains. So, clearly we have pluralistic cultural developments happening in the Neolithic and Iron Age period as a prelude to uh, early historic period. So, this particular uh, slide shows uh, the southern Neolithic culture. You can look at these sites are mainly concentrated in Andhra, Karnataka and uh, uh, parts of uh, Tamil Nadu. Next. These are some of the important sites already excavated by Alchin and Padaya and several other researchers like Kodakal, Thik, uh, uh, Sanganakallu, Maski and all these sites, they have ash homes in the center and people living all around. Uh, and Professor Padaya also has uh, excavated some of these sites. Next. So here I am going to talk about the site of Molapolayam. Uh, which we excavated in 2021. It lies very close to Payamputur across the Palkad Gap. So this site has important implication for maritime interactions. Uh, next, this is the map of Palkad Gap where there are so many uh, megalithic iron age sites. This is the scenario in Tamil Nadu side. We have Payamputur, Noyal River Valley. Next. This is the, where the site is located. It is behind this uh, uh, behind this Palgat Gap towards the north west of Koyambutur, uh, a place called uh, Vadivelam Palayam, where there is a Nirular settlement and this uh, Neolithic site is very beautifully surrounded by hillocks. Uh, I will not go into the detail of the site and uh, very interestingly we have found three skeletons and they are securely datable to 1600 BCE to 1400 BCE and uh, this is very important uh, uh, evidence we had and uh, we found three skeletons one is that of an adult woman in middle age and two children they were found in this area we have several other evidence I am not going to discuss for like that Time. So this is the uh, burial uh, of an adult uh, lady and uh, Dr. Veena Mushrif Tripathi has uh, identified. Next. Yeah. Uh, two baby skeletons. Next. Next. So we have evidence of storage pits. Very interestingly at the site we found lot of animal bones and storage pits uh, and several other materials. Next. You can get an idea of the size of the pit. Probably people were sometime living and also we found a lot of grains. Next. We also found so many animals that have been studied by Dr. G.S. Abayam from Kerala University. Next. Yeah, animal bones. Next. 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 Yeah. I will come to the important part. Very importantly, we found three shell beads in the uh, context dating between 1600 to 1400 BCE and we found two beads of Oliver's SP which is a, also a shell bead and also we found a fish pattern made of lamellidan shell and terracotta ball. So these are some of the important evidence we have. Next. This is a cut fragment of Tarbinella pyram shell, marine shell occurring in hinterland, say at Koyambutur, nearest to sea is either one has to come to Kerala or one has to go another 400 km or 350 km to the east to Nagapattinam or uh, Pamban coast. Next, you can see this uh, Oliva SP shell uh, which has been used all across the world by the uh, Neolithic people for uh, as a bead, as an ornament. Next, this is a modern Oliva SP shell, which is a marine shell. We found two shell. One was probably tied around the hand of this lady. Another was around the hip. 
Very interestingly, if you look at some of the tribal communities of South India, they were fond of shell ornaments. And uh, if you look at the image of Kannapa Nayana, yeah, uh, you know about the story of Kannapa Nayana, who is associated with the Bhakti movement. And this bronze image as, is found in Tanjavur Art Gallery, it belongs to Chodar period. So you can see in that image, Kannapa Nayana wearing a shell Channavira. It is a traditional ornament and it is made of uh, shell and that species is called Moneta Moneta. This Moneta Moneta species was used as a currency in Bengal region and uh, you can see that these early communities were you know, very keen on the marine shells as ornament. And this particular shell has been identified by Aarti Deshpande Bugarchi, but I am showing a modern example so that you can get an understanding how exactly the shell looks next. So very interestingly we found another fresh water mussel from Molapolayam, which is actually a pendant. They have made a pendant in the shape of a fish with two perforations. You can see the scales also very minutely carved here. Uh, next slide. So, what I am trying to argue here is that these networks of uh, trade or exchange had established in southern India as early as 1600 BCE. And at the same side, we also found interesting painted shirts. Uh, what is known as reserve painted uh, technique that has been used here and it somewhat resembles the late, later day russet coated painted bear uh, and that is another important finding. Next. We have more evidence from Molapolayam. Uh, my main argument and main, main uh, reason for showing this particular uh, uh, part of this presentation is that in southern India the network of trade had established in mid 2nd millennium BC because these marine shells have moved across from the coast to the hinterland. We also have marine shells in the Deccan Chalcolithic sites and also in southern Neolithic sites in Karnataka. So, definitely something is going on in mid 2nd uh, millennium uh, BC. So, uh, clearly these people were. Uh, exchanging these produce. So, this indirectly implies that there were people in the coastal areas. Fishing uh, communities were there collecting shells and they were sending it for exchanging. So, clearly we have evidence for these uh, exchange system. Then we come to the Iron Age. Iron Age exchange network. We know Iron Age is, uh, is a very important period in Kerala. As well as in southern India, we have evidence of megalithic burials and we have evidence of shell ornaments, carnelian beads which are believed to have been uh, brought from uh, Gujarat region. We also have copper bronze objects in large number. Definitely by uh, around 1000 BC, the network of trade, network of exchange was well established in southern India. So that, that's very clear. Unfortunately, we have done we have not done enough research on the INE. So this is a one uh, research problem uh, that we need to address. Next, I'm showing some images. Next, uh, these are some of the shell objects from the site of Sanu uh, from Odugatu. Sorry, it is near Bellu, where F.J. Richards have uh, recovered them in 1920s. Uh, next, this is from Sanu. Next, these are the shell ornaments from Sanu. So clearly, this uh, maritime connection existed in the Iron Age. Next, next, yeah, uh, previous one. So this one is very important because uh, we have a lot of parallels between the ornaments of the megalithic and Naga ornaments. Some of the Naga tribal communities they prefer the shell objects and it is believed that they were moving uh, to the Naga land through from southern India. So that is a very important source 
and James Hutton found lot of similarities. Next. Now, we are uh, moving into the early and age uh, maritime exchange. We always uh, study about the Indus Valley civilization. We know a lot about the Indus Valley civilization and their connection with the West Asian civilization. But we do not know if really the Indus Valley people had any connection with Kerala. Obviously, these people might have you know, connected with Kerala, but unfortunately, we don't have uh, any account. Kusuman, in his uh, report, he says about, uh, talks about biblical account and the teak went from Kerala for Solomon's palace and Nebuchadnezzar's uh, references and all he mentioned. But more importantly, uh, recently I want to, uh, you know, recently found evidence, there are two pieces of evidence that I want to place before you. One is in the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II's mummy, they found the peppercorn in his nostril. They date this to 1230 BCE. So they clearly say in 1230 BCE, this pepper might have come from Kerala or southern India. So this is a very important piece of evidence. And there is another piece of evidence found in this way. Uh, and uh, Tigori, Namdar and another scholar they have published in Israel, they have found 27 flowers fla uh, of this shape. And uh, there is something called ceramic residue analysis in archaeology. Uh, at Israel, they found cinnamaldehyde, cinnamon, uh, traces of cinnamon in these uh, jobs. And it, the paper has been published and they are dated to 900 BCE. They say that around 900 BCE, the trade connection with Southeast Asia and Southern India was well established. So, I would like to highlight uh, these evidences to suggest that definitely uh, trade or exchange, maritime exchange must have happened in uh, first millennium BC, but we have not focused. We can't uh, blame anybody because we have evidence primarily for a period after 300 BCE. So we need to look for such sites and date the evidence. Now, next. So uh, now I am moving to the core part of my uh, lecture in which I will be talking about uh, the maritime and hinterland uh, exchanges. But before that, I would like to highlight that there are several sources for understanding Kerala's history and we look at them in a fragmentary manner. This is where I feel we need a kind of holistic understanding. We have early Tamil text of Sangam Corpus. I have also listed the author, different sources and scholars who have studied. We have early Tamil text. They present a beautiful poetic narrative of the early Tamil society. Then we have Greco-Roman texts. They talk about the maritime connection and the trade network and everything. Uh, and several scholars have worked on these sources. Then we have megalithic burials of Kerala. Sometimes we tend to treat them as separate areas, like Indo-Roman trade separate, megalithic culture as separate. Rajan Gurukal uh, very clearly pointed out they all deal with the same society. They are of different sources of the same society. We need to look at them in an integrated manner. So we have material culture from the megalithic burials of Kerala studied by several scholars and uh, materials from the habitation sites like Patanam on the Kerala side and then Karur and Kodumanal on the Tamil Nadu side. Then we talk about Roman coins. They are treated as separate category of evidence. Then we have punch mark coins published by P.L. Gupta found uh, all across Kerala. Then we have rock art. Sometimes we tend to push rock art to the prehistoric period. In fact, rock art, mainly Edakal and other sites in Kerala, probably some of them date to the Iron Age. They were very much part of this Iron Age early historic period and people were living around uh, that area. We cannot treat these rock art as being created at one point 
point of time they were something like palimpsestic which means that created over a period of time multiple layers that is all we need to look at so this rakat is also one particular source and then brahmi or tamil brahmi inscriptions we have some at edakkal there are some inscription maybe pugalu in tamil nadu which talks about chera kings uh, so uh, this historical integration of these multiple sources is very important next so this is one important uh, inscription that i want to highlight this was found at pugalu muda amannan yattur sengayaban urai it is found on a cave shelter made meant for jain monk and it refers to three generation of chera kings ko adan chellurum porai magan san peru kadungon peru kadungon second king magan ilan kadungon so this uh, uh, particular inscription mentions about three chera kings ko adan chellurum porai peru kadungon ilan kadungon Uh, they are mentioned as sons of each other and they donated a cave bed for the senior uh, jain monk muda muda means elder amanna jain uh, this chamana cha becomes answered it becomes amana in tamil and yatu atu sengaiban sengkashyaban maybe it was a jain man so this is one important inscription second inscription related to kerala is found at muthupatti near madurai uh, this reads nakka peru rudai musuri kodan ilamagan i have highlighted that unfortunately it is not very clear where musuri is written Yeah. So, so coming to this now, we are moving to the 
Sangam literature, there is a very important poem, Purananuru 335. This is a very beautiful poem, uh, which talks about the traditional values of that particular society. Uh, the poem says, uh, at the, the most uh, important part at the end, there is no God other than the stone of the warrior who passed away after killing the elephant of the enemies. The stone is worshipped by offering paddy grains. That is how the poem reads at the end. Then the same poem says, Tudiyan Panan Parayan Kadamban in Nan Kudimala. These are the words, probably they, the poet meant these were the original inhabitants or original communities or traditional communities. What the Kudi, the term Kudi we can interpret as ethnic group. Then they see the there are three flowers, Kunji, uh, that put particular portion of the poem is not very clear. They talk about there are only four flowers, others are not flowers. There are only four types of grains, others are not grains. There, there is only this type of God, other is not. There is uh, There are only four types of people, others are not. You know, that is how the poem uh, says. So it also very interestingly, it talks about Varag, uh, Tinai, Kol and Avarai. These are the important food, others are not. So very interestingly, out of these four, three are uh, found, uh, even all the four are found in the Neolithic context and three are found at the site of Molokolayam. So this also has another information that these people were worshipping the hero stone. Actually, the, the poem says, hero stone is the only God, others are not God. That is how the poem, uh, the poet uh, says. So, the poet implies hero stone is the original God and that is worshipped by offering paddy. Very importantly, in the four important food types, it does not include paddy. It says only Varag, Tinai, Kollu and Avarai. So, uh, this suggests that paddy was something exotic at that point of time, in the early historic time. Probably, it was not cultivated everywhere, only in the riverine tract, in the, in the Vardum region. And that is why they were offering it to this hero stone. They were not offering the four traditional food here. Uh, and very interestingly, in the excavation at Purundal, undertaken by Ra uh, Rajan and Adichinadu, several sites, rice is found along with the megalithic burial. So, this particular poem is very important, Purana 335, you can go and read. It uh, talks about the traditional value as prevailed in the somewhere around the early uh, common era. So, it is a very important poem that I wanted to uh, highlight the actual poem. Uh, I will not uh, go into reading it because you can check by yourself, there is no time. Uh, so, very interestingly, uh, our Polapalayam excavation, we have analyzed and uh, this has been studied by Dr. Shatir Nayak. We have found three of the grains mentioned in the uh, Sangam poem. Next. Uh, these are the grains that we found at Molapalaya. Next. Yeah. So, these are the grains that we have from Patanam excavation. So, I am trying to focus on the subsistence goods like, uh, uh, you know, basic uh, subsistence commodities that were produced in the land, agrarian produce. Uh, at the Patanam excavation, we have evidence of rice and uh, say wheat. Wheat was probably exotic came as part of the trade, green gram, lentil um, and uh, mango, Indian gooseberry and all that. So this is something very important. We have diverse varieties of uh, food uh, resources that were coming to the Patanam. They definitely indicate these are perishable materials. In archaeological context, we don't find them. So this is something very uh, important and uh, these people were trading diverse uh, subsistence goods and they were coming to uh, Patanam. Next. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, coming to the rice crop from Kerala, we have evidence uh, probably of uh, rice cultivation from the marshy lands of Kerala around 1000 BCE. Purundal Adichinulu, I already mentioned. Patanam, we have evidence of uh, rice uh, grains. And uh, this poem, uh, very 3 Purana 343, mentions about rice being exchanged near the port of Musiri. Uh, and uh, also uh, we have similar references around Tundi. So clearly these people were uh, exchanging. Next, uh, we have a lot of references for pepper and spices and other uh, crops. And if you look at Periplus, we have a lot of references to uh, exchange of, uh, you know, uh, important material, spices. Uh, Periplus mentions that pepper and malabatram were the important uh, produce that were exported. And uh, this particular uh, Sangha poem, Purundohai 90, mentions about roaring and raining clouds in the hills where grows pepper plant. So that is a beautiful reference. Uh, and uh, probably pepper was collected as a wild forest produce and also. I am uh, putting this theory that it would not have been impossible to collect pepper just from the wild source. So I am uh, uh, placing here that pepper was cultivated in early historic Kerala and uh, when we talk about the early historic um, Indian Ocean or Indo Roman trade, it was not only the traders, the entire communities of Kerala they participated. Mainly the so-called hunter-gatherers living in the hills, they were also very much active part of the trade. So we should uh, think, consider this trade as something incorporating all communities of Kerala from the hill to the coast and pepper cultivation must have taken place in various um, landscapes. It would not have been possible to gather the amount of pepper that when you look at the Greco-Roman sources, it is very clear that they, uh, you know, uh, exported pepper in bulk and it would not have been possible to collect only from the uh, wild sources. And labor, I am also trying to argue that labor and labor organization was another important factor here and somebody was, you know, uh, organizing the system and uh, they were, uh, you know, gathering these produce in which all communities and people uh, participated. So, uh, this is one of my argue, uh, argument here. We have several references to pepper and here it talks about Karivala Adikkattu, Adikkam. So, it talks about the beauty of this particular uh, land of the Kundranadan. Kundram means hill. Uh, the friendship of Kundranadan, where you have this uh, uh, hills where we have a uh, pepper plant and there is uh, heavy rain and clouds and all that. So it is being very beautifully narrated here. Next. Uh, and uh, coming to this narration in Periplus, we have uh, several imports, mainly coins, Roman coins, topaz, uh, precious gem, which we, and also there is a belief system behind these. Ornaments. See, when we deal with uh, archaeology, we look at them as material culture. We don't look into the belief system behind. But when you look at the uh, literature as well as Roman texts, you understand why people preferred these gems. People might have preferred it for certain kind of luck. Uh, and also, we have reference to thin clothing as uh, one of the import to southern India, uh, figured linens textile, copper and tin and uh, lead. So, we have uh, reference to this Yavana Vinayamad Nankalam Ponnadu Vandu Kariyodu Payarum Aganamuru 149. So, here Pon, Pon is a generic name. It also means metal as well as gold. Today Pon means gold, but when you look at Sangam literature reference, it occurs in different contexts. Sometimes it refers to gold Sometimes a common term for metal. So, this Ponnodu Vandu Kariyodu Payarum is very clear reference for uh, this pepper and uh, gold exchange. We have 
wine import probably they were meant for this wine was uh, meant for the use of the traders but very interestingly we also find amazing we look at them as material culture we don't look into the belief system behind but when you look at the uh, literature as well as roman texts you understand why people preferred these gems people might have preferred it for certain kind of luck uh, and also we have reference to thin clothing as uh, one of the import to southern india uh, figured linens textile copper and tin and uh, lead so we have uh, reference to this yavana vinaymar nankalam ponnadu vandu kariyodu payam aganaanur 149 so here pon pon is a generic name it also means metal as well as gold today pon means gold but when you look at sangam literature reference it occurs in different context sometime it refers to gold sometime a common term for metal so this ponnadu vandu kariyodu payam is very clear reference for uh, this pepper and uh, gold exchange we have wine import probably they were meant for this wine was uh, meant for the use of the traders but very interestingly there is reference to naragu so they probably refer to uh, different kinds of liquor probably pidi nodai pidi is another term probably they were referring to toddy from the tree coconut tree and uh, rice beer and uh, roman wine so very interestingly they use different terms uh, theral is the term used for uh, wine we also get the sulfide of uh, oil, uh, antimony uh, and that was important we get antimony rod uh, in copper at patanam and also in kidadi and uh, it is said that this uh, paste was used for to cure certain sores in the eye and also as a cosmetic uh, and also we get uh, reference to import of raw uh, unfinished glass and raw sulfide of arsenic they also refer to real gun uh, it was used as a medicine uh, and also as a pigment so uh, actually we are dealing with uh, uh, diverse varieties of goods and they were imported for the different needs of the society in fact uh, we are not we have not really looked into the use of these uh, goods and how these people were using in southern india Uh, and also there is a reference to uh, arpiment and a rare uh, it is a rare uh, sulfide used as a yellow pigment that means uh, people in southern india or beyond they were uh, getting different kinds of uh, commodities and they were producing different kinds of goods it is not that they were getting only the finished product they were also uh, getting lot of ideas and they were getting raw material and they were fabricating material here uh, and uh, in the greek text of uh, periplus we also have reference to export items we have reference to fine pearls fine pearls it is said that one type of uh, pearl was produced near mutsuri and we have uh, also the site of kolchi or korkai in tamil nadu then reference to ivory silk got spike knot from ganges and they clearly indicate that a uh, lot of things were being produced and they were imported some of the roman glass and the gold jewelry production um, here uh, i am trying to argue that uh, roman coins roman gold coins were one of the important sources uh, and very interestingly what you see at the bottom left is from kiradi what you see on the right is from patanam so these people were fabricating different kinds of uh, material and especially on the extreme right you can see a small amphora or jar like a ornament it very clearly suggests that ideas were flowing ideas were flowing across the indian ocean and people were producing different kinds of goods for the market for local as well as foreign market we have uh, found lot of gold uh, uh, object from various sites from megalithic sites as well as from the uh, 
Helic historic habitation sites like Patanam, Kiradi, Kodumanal, and from the megalithic site of Arupa, Aripa and Puriyur and Suthukeni uh, in Tamil Nadu, Aripa and Puriyur in Kerala, we have gold dominance. So definitely, these centers like Patanam are acting uh, as some kind of special economic zone, something like Kochi, producing diverse goods and they were uh, being marketed in the hinterland. So this is something uh, very important and I am showing more images showing you know, how diverse kinds of goods that came to Kerala coast, gold ornaments and uh, different kinds of uh, intaglios, uh, these uh, Roman god of Fortuna and uh, springs, all these exotic ideas and uh, next copper working, we have clear evidence for copper working and fabricating uh, different kinds of coins which is also very important and these uh, urban centers or poor towns uh, were the places where they were making these kinds of goods and uh, why they were making because these were the centers where they were getting raw material and they fabricated goods and then uh, circulated next and we have copper objects uh, what you see on the left is from Kudubanal uh, excavation by ASI, they have found a copper needle with something like a tiger figure or a dog figure, it is not very clear on top and you get diverse varieties of jewellery. At the right, what you see is an antimony rod uh, which was used as an eyeliner or cold stick. You get uh, uh, lead uh, sheets, diverse varieties of material mainly in the early historic urban centre. See, how can you understand this material culture? Sometimes it is only possible for the archaeologists. I have excavated a Neolithic site where in Molopole we get only bones, 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 nothing else. Bones and pottery. We have excavated some sites, small rural villages at Papinayak and Patti, where we find only bones, not even one single bead. So when you look into the material culture of different sites, and compare it with Patanam or compare it with Kiradi or Arikamedu, you will understand the material richness of the settlements after 300 BCE, mainly after 1st century BC. So, in order to understand the material culture of the early historic period, you need to go through all the excavation reports of the Neolithic and the Iron Age site. How you no, know, it has to come into your mind as a visualization. Only then you will be able to understand the richness and diversity of the materials that are found at sites like Patanam or Kiradi or Aragonpula. That is why we call them as urban centers where diverse goods were fabricated and they were like markets, they were like ports where you know different goods and different peoples from different points. So, uh, space they came and assembled and exchanged. They were market centers. So, by looking at these objects, we will be able to imagine. So, here we have evidence for next uh, iron metallurgy, diverse goods, uh, and the iron objects they are mainly from Patana. You can see it's an excavation next. Yeah, this is an ornament mold found from uh, Kodumanal. Uh, and very interestingly, we have several such pieces from Patanam also. So, this is another important piece of evidence that these people were fabricating all these uh, metals and producing diverse goods. And what you see in uh, on, on the right hand side is from another uh, site called Chamba. So, we, I, I don't show Patanam uh, images here. So, we have exactly same kind of uh, mold at Patanam. So what you see remarkably, some of the artifacts that you are finding in southern India, they are very similar to what is found in Roman Empire. So clearly it indicates a connectivity across the Indian Ocean. So ideas flow, it, they were not only goods, ideas, technology, sometimes craftsperson. We have evidence of a, a stone found in Thailand dated to 3rd, 4th century CE reading Perun Patankal. Patan means a goldsmith. Probably this Patan or a goldsmith visited Southeast Asia. So clearly uh, there were uh, people were moving, commodities were moving, ideas were moving, technologies were moving in the uh, Indian Ocean region mainly from 
third century, post third century, or post first century. It's very uh, remarkable. Next, some more material culture, previous one from Kodumana. Uh, next, diverse uh, kinds of precious stones from Patanam. So, same kind of material you will not find in all the sites. You will find only at certain uh, points on the landscape. You know, that itself indicates that they were production hubs or manufacturing centers. Next. Next. Ah, this is another reference. Now, we will move on to uh, literature. Uh, I always feel that literature is very important. Sometimes, uh, you know, historians ignore uh, this literature. Uh, Sometimes we think it is, uh, you know, entirely exaggerated and also oral tradition. I am sure oral tradition should be handled with care because we cannot take whatever found in literature directly and whatever found in oral tradition directly and interpret history. It can become dangerous. But we need to very carefully sift these sources. So when you look at uh, the literature, it gives a completely uh, different perspective. What I would say, if you find uh, a kind of uh, chicken meals with, uh, you know, after consuming, what you find is broken pieces of chicken on one side. What do you see on the other side? You see a complete image of a chicken. It's entirely different. The same way, what uh, archaeology shows is only the bits and pieces of fragmentary remains. When it comes to the literature, it tells you the whole, it's like a complete painting. Uh, literature gives you a complete narrative painting. But if you look at archaeology, you get bits and pieces of pottery from which you reconstruct one aspect of material culture. So, uh, this is where I said, you know, we need to leave diverse uh, sources. Uh, and uh, this Padittu uh, Patra 67 mentions, uh, you know, very beautifully, uh, as the poet tells the Panar, Panars were the bards, they were very poor people. Um, and they were moving across uh, the territories and they were offering information to the chiefs and kings and they were getting parisil or prize. So, this particular poem says that uh, it tells, oh, oh, oh Panar, if you go to um, the king, Chera king, he will give you uh, the ornaments that were made out of the out of the pearl from the site of Pandar, port of Pandar. We don't know where exactly the port of Pandar or Pandar was located. And then the, he will give you the ornaments produced at Kodumanam, uh, which is identified with uh, Kodumanam. And there is another poem, uh, Padipat 74, that mentions Kodumanam Patta Vinayman Arugalam. It says about the beautiful ornaments produced at Kodumana uh, uh, and also it talks about Pandar. Uh, so these two sites are spoken together. Pandar, probably a port on the Kerala side where they were collecting pearls uh, and it is something very important and this particular poem goes on to tell how it says as Nalantar Thirumani, how they were making uh, an ornament by using the skin of a deer and they were attaching all these gems onto the skin of the deer. The skin of the deer has been cut round and then processed. So, what you get in archaeology is only the gems. But when you look at the literature, it narrates how these ornaments were uh, made. So, this Padatupatri 74 poem is very uh, important. And uh, next, I am coming to the Roman coins. I think Roman coins were used as ornaments and also as a kind of money with a fixed value probably used as a bullion as scholars have said that they were not like modern currencies but uh, I do believe that metal coins were used as a form of uh, exchange and they stored wealth because the literature very clearly mentions about Valam, Valam Kedum Siri uh, the, wealth, the, the concept of wealth is very beautifully uh, described as Valam uh, and also you know that there were Valangiers, a trader group called Valangiers in the later period. So the term 
Palam Kedu Musri is very important and uh, we don't find evidence of coins in the pre early historic period. In pre-300 BC, maybe some punch box coins came and uh, these coins were definitely used as a kind of, uh, you know, medium of exchange. Uh, and uh, coming to the references in Sangam literature, we have numerous references. There is in Ahnanuru 363, uh, so the gooseberry on the stony waste uh, appears like the polen seikas, the term polen. So uh, what is important with the literature is the terms and terminology. We can really uh, go and dig deeper into the meaning of the term. There is a term called algul, uh, describing women's body. Algul uh, as uh, you know, filled with a lot of coins. Probably it is uh, talking about kind of an ornament in which Roman coins were attached. We do not know, but there are a lot of debates about the meaning of uh, these terms. Uh, so, Polense Kasi. Uh, Kasi is very interestingly a term that is used for a coin, and Polem means gold. Um, so, another uh, kind of reference which refers to the toothbrush uh, tree, uh, which is Salvadora Persia, Manikasana Malnindra Irungani Ugani. Mensinai Udirvana Kadiyum Veni Menchuram Aganamuru 293 uh, Another uh, reference Asil Kamiyan Masaram Punainda Polam Sai Palkas Pal means multiple So that Polam Polam means gold Aninda Algul Algul is probably refers to the uh, hip portion or slightly underbelly so, the poet says that this particular ornament had gold coins, multiple gold coins uh, that, that is uh, uh, occurring in uh, Puram 353. There are so many uh, uh, references. Lusupil palkas nereitha kodeind algul. Kodeind the term algul uh, is very uh, important and there are scholars are debating what is the meaning of algul. Sometimes they say it is gift or under belly. Uh, and uh, this particular Ragnanur poem it says Meliyal Kuru Mahal. Kuru Mahal. Mahal means Kuru means very short. Meliyal means very tender, you know, that, uh, very uh, tender character. Uh, and uh, also uh, there is another reference Polam Pasum Pandi Kasinirai Algul. So uh, this there are several beautiful references to, uh, you know, uh, Roman coins, probably Roman coins or other type of gold coins or modified or, uh, objects used as uh, ornaments. So, you, you get uh, several such uh, references here. Next, uh, we have uh, distribution of Roman coins all across. I will not again go into the detail. Next. So, uh, what I argue is that the Roman coins were um, uh, used as a kind of money and people were uh, very much aware of the investment in coin and probably it was not preferred. There is a beautiful reference to a pastoral, a lady of a pastoral community and she, uh, it is said she would not get gold or gold coin for her ghee but would get cow and black female buffalo. That means she does not want to invest the money in the gold. Nai vilai katti pasumpun kollal. Yerumai nallan karunak perum. So that occurs in Purupana to Padai. That means this pastoral, uh, the shepherd lady, does not prefer to get uh, the gold for her ghee. Rather, she would prefer a buff buffalo and a cow so that she can earn more money by selling the milk. Probably it was, uh, it was not useful for her. This is where I argue that coin as a currency was used at one level probably by the traders who wanted to take away, store and take away the wealth. Whereas the local people, some of them did not prefer coin. So we need to see that different uh, types of exchanges and economies 
existed in that point of time. At one level, barter. At another level, they were using coins as a medium of exchange. Uh, that is why we cannot generalize and say that people were using only water. So there existed different type of exchanges according to the player who is uh, selling, who is buying. So probably a same trader who will be doing water on one hand and he will be doing uh, money exchange on another hand. Next, we have a uh, uh, lot of evidence of punch more coins. These are from Kodumanal. So this concept of uh, you know uh, extensive use of money is something very important. Next, uh, and uh, already I discussed these references. So probably Chodas also wanted to you know uh, use money or a currency after seeing the Roman coins. That is why next, uh, that is why uh, we see a lot of uh, Chera coins at Patanam. I think they have found more than hundred or something. Uh, and that is something very important. Probably Patanam was the place where they were uh, minting these uh, coins. And uh, coming to this uh, diverse resources of Chera country, we get a very beautiful reference in Padittu um, Patta. It uh, mentions Kadalavum. That means things were coming from the sea, uh, commodities were coming from the hill, and commodities were coming from the River. So this is something very important, uh, and uh, we also have uh, you know different kinds of people. Uh, apart from material production, there are also service providers, bards and poets and priests who were offering services, and they were getting um, you know uh, they were getting paid through different means. So we need to take that also as part of uh, exchange. Now I am moving to the next part, agents of production and uh, commodities and services who produce the com commodities and materials, real culture uh, and uh, communities living in various eco zones, farmers, fishers and pastoralists. There is a paper by Daniel Stiles uh, in the Indo-Roman trade related to Gujarat region where he says the hill tribes also had a very important role in the uh, maritime trade. Often, you know, we don't give much importance to uh, these kind of communities. In fact, you know, uh, we should uh, reconceptualize that the Indian Ocean or Roman trade involved all these uh, communities. We have evidence of farming, craft groups, uh, potters, blacksmiths and uh, metalsmiths and glass and ornament workers. If you look at some of the literature, uh, very interestingly it tells the pastoral communities and farmers when they are plowing the land, they are sometimes finding precious stones. Recently, one of our students did field work in Kwaibutur in Padiyur region and these farmers were collecting precious stones from the land when they were plowing and then these stones were collected by the uh, traders. It was happening till 10 15 years ago. Now the government has banned this activity. I have seen this happening around the Kodumana. There used to be a person coming and collecting these. So, probably uh, such stones collected uh, across the landscapes were transported to centers like uh, Patana. So, uh, clearly, in this, uh, you know, mobilization of resources and raw materials, entire community was uh, involved and we have references to Yavanas, migrant craftsperson and migrating uh, craftsperson. We have uh, evidence from in, uh, uh, Southeast Asia where Bernice Bellina has found evidence for the presence of Indian craftsmen at Tom Shokau. Uh, at a site and um, uh, also the labor, the, the idea of offering labor and labor service as part of the trade is also very important and similarly we have to consider the poets and gods also as agent of production of services and sometimes the poets might have also, gods might have also involved in a, a kind of gift trade because there is a reference in the Sangam literature where somebody mentions Maniha Parisilan Al Lelam. That means I don't, uh, uh, you know, I am not a commercial 
person. That is how there is a reference. Uh, that is something very important. And next question is agents who are controllers of production and uh, intermediaries. And we can definitely say that local communities are the main agencies uh, organizing produ production, at least in some context. Sometimes traders might have developed uh, facilities. We can ask the question who developed Patanam? How did Patanam develop as a center? Who was involved? Uh, you know, it is a very complicated question. Probably the traders, they came in and uh, everything emerged out of traders. Then later on, uh, the kings might have controlled or probably the political system existed because we have clear reference to Cherachora Pandya in Ashokan inscription. So, uh, clearly, uh, and uh, these traders might have had some kind of agreement with the local chiefs. Uh, uh, so, traders also could have organized uh, production and also we notice uh, references to the specialized traders. Uh, we have references in uh, um, Tamil Brahmi inscriptions uh, about people who are dealing in pulam and gold and salt and all that. Some of these inscriptions are found in uh, Adhagar Malai in Tamil Nadu uh, and uh, also we have uh, sailors and navigators uh, and uh, Yamana traders. We know that uh, some of the trade was undertaken by the Yamana traders. But these uh, Tamil Brahmi inscription found in Egypt and other places like Kanan, Chatan, Kotrapumar, Nandai Kiran, they clearly indicate that people from southern India and also from Kerala were trading because they were moving uh, across the land. Next. Coming to this process, finally, the final section, uh, the process of exchange. How does uh, exchange happen? Uh, Karl Ponagi he talks about three type of uh, exchanges, reciprocal and redistribution and market economy. Rajan Gurukal has elaborated uh, on this. So reciprocal economy, probably uh, it was existing at that time, a kind of water. But sometimes the water was not uh, like simply reciprocal, it was mutual and uh, it was also measured. So when we look at the reference we can find and the vendors were doing this uh, redistribution. Uh, and we don't have any evidence for market kind of economy but currency economy sometimes these foreign traders and the traders might have used, not exactly market economy. And I would also like to argue the neg negative forms of exchange, for example, piracy, cattle lifting, battle and war booty, and uh, you know they were also part of one-sided exchange, forced exchange. We should also take them into uh, consideration, and then uh, donation to the partners that is also very important. So next. Now we will come to the terms used in literature. We have reference to maru. Maru means to exchange. Uh, Nalmur maru nalama meini sirukudai alvilai unarvi kilayuda aruthi. So we have a clear reference for people selling buttermilk for grains. Then paalodu vandu koododu payaru yadudai idai. Here the sheep goat pastoralists come with milk and goes with cool or something like tiny uh, gruel. Uh, and then uh, you know you get a lot of such uh, references next. There is another uh, beautiful reference in Padhidrupat 30 where this um, you know Vetuva with murderous bow exchange elephant tusk and meat of the deer and get toddy at Niyamam. So this is where the term Niyamam is very important. Niyamam was probably a marketplace. There is reference to Purnudai Niyamam. So these words probably Patanam was something like that, you know, Purnudai Niyamam. There is reference to Niyamam Udu. So this is also something very uh, important and here these vetivars are described as wearing kamdal flower, gloria superba flower and uh, this, uh, these kind of narrations really give us a, a graphic picture which we cannot obtain through the 
uh, material culture. Again, the concepts such as Niyamam, Niyamam Udu, they are also very interesting and that is the uh, speciality of literature. So, uh, you know, which gives an alternative perspectives of the period apart from the material culture. We also get, you know, the terms, as I said, the certain terms mentioned in the uh, literature uh, are very important. Silver, butter of uh, equal value of salt and paddy. Uppil nere, vengal, nelin nere, vengal uppu. That means it clearly says that uh, same quantity of paddy uh, it, uh, and salt, they are considered equal. So here, nelin nere, vengal uppenai. Cheri vilai maru kuralin. Cheri vilai maru. Again, the, look at the term maru. Neer equal. So these kind of technical terms also. Nella uppu neere uri. Uri kolvi rena. Cheri dorum nuvalum. So that is there in uh, Aham. Uh, and also, there is a beautiful reference uh, in Puram 33 uh, where the Betugan gives the dear me venition and the third is brought in Tasundu by the pastoral uh, lady and the farmers bring uh, rice. So they are uh, being exchanged and also in Patinapalai there is a reference to Vellai Upi, white salts rice, Kollai. So Kollai is again an important term. So when you look at the literature, uh, we get uh, the minute nature of the exchanges. Fish for paddy by the panas that also occurs. Um, so many such references. Varal fish in vati refilled with bennel, white rice. Uh, so, so several such references occur. I am not going to the detail. Uh, and then salt being exchanged by paddy by the women. Uh, and uh, that is also spoken. And kurum pallur nedin chonat vellai upin kollai satri. Umanar Tanda Uppu Nodai. The term Nodai is very important. It talks about exchange or a price or some kind of value. Umanar Tanda Uppu Nodai Nel. So Umanars were the salt merchants who were travelling across the country and they were selling salt. Next. So the term Nodu or Nodai Nodutal that is being spoken. I uh, already mentioned, sometimes these people are exchanging uh, tusk of elephant just for toddy. Imagine, you know, at one level, uh, at the grassroot level, people are exchanging sometimes high price goods for a simple toddy and then later on, when it transfers to the hands of the merchants, to a foreign trader, it would have got higher value. Now you can understand why in Sangha literature, there are frequent references to the hero. Uh, again, it could be a literary motive adopted repeatedly. We have very frequent uh, references in the literature that the hero moves away to the town to earn wealth, leaving his beautiful uh, lover or heroine. So that is a frequently occurring theme, more particularly found in uh, Palai uh, Thinen. Uh, next. Uh, and also, uh, there are some beautiful references to Parandava. So, Selva Tangeya means, you know, uh, favorite uh, younger sister of the fisher folk. Uh, so, she comes and sells, exchanges um, her fish for some other uh, goods. So, that is a very beautiful reference in Nagana on the 320. So, you get a lot of references. It will not be able to you know, explain everything here. Uh, so, flower sellers, they are also sp spoken. And one good thing about literature is it graphically narrates the people. Whereas, if you look at archaeological material, you get only material culture. You get only tables and statistics. But uh, actually, literature had the flesh. But again, you know, uh, we need to be uh, very careful when using the references, but at least it helps us to visualize. What uh, I always argue is that historians and archaeologists need to need visualization. An archaeologist who is not familiar with the material culture from industrialization 
who is not familiar with the material, with the patanam, with a small settlement or medium settlement, cannot visualize. How do you visualize? This visualization is very important. We live in the contemporary information technology age. Our visualization is influenced by digital media. So we need to uh, kind of visualize things by looking at ethnographic documents uh, and also uh, the literature and material culture. Only then you can uh, create a kind of uh, narrative uh, and that is where I argue that uh, next uh, I, that is where I argue that literature is very important. Sometimes we tend to ignore literature and study only the uh, material culture. So this particular uh, poem, it talks uh, in the context of Pulli, uh, chief of the Vengadam near Tirupati region. Uh, it talks about the uh, warriors of him, uh, you know, warriors of Pulli who kill elephant and they exchange the task for toddy. So this is something very interesting. Uh, often, if you look at literature, the exchange of ivory or task is often for toddy or other kind of uh, material. Next. And also we get uh, reference to exchange of roots for honey, sewer can for uh, owl or bitter rice, munition for wine uh, or toddy, uh, and pearl for toddy at the site of Kurkai. Uh, there are several uh, kinds of uh, beautiful references. Next. Again, elephant tusks for uh, toddy that occurs very beautifully. Uh, and uh, this is also a very nice poem. It tells Kandal Veli Sirigudi Pasipya. It also classifies settlement as Sirigudi. Kadimkan Vegatu. So, the elephant's eye is very, you know, very, uh, what do you say, very uh, strong or something very harsh. Kodu Nudut, the term Nudu also comes, it is spoken in the uh, context of uh, Koli Hills, uh, you know, which was conquered by the Cheras in the later period. Next. Uh, yeah. So, long distance uh, trade, already I mentioned about Agana Nuru, uh, like Purnudu uh, Vandu Kariyadu Peyaru, that is one of that. Uh, uh, References. Then redistribution. Either, either also very important. It was done by these chiefs. This particular poem, poem 343, Malay Tharamum, Kadal Tharamum, Talai Peidu, Varudanthi Iyum, Polandar Kutuvan. Here, Kutuvan. Kutuvan is a Chera king. So he is in control of the network. He uh, gets the Malay Tharam, the produce from the hill, Kadal Tharam, produce from the sea or the imports from the sea. So he mixes and gives it to the uh, people who come to him as bond. So the, these kind of donation and also it mentions E in. E means donate. Polanda or Putuvan. Again the Putuvan is wearing a golden ornament. So this kind of redistribution was also one important uh, reference. Next, uh, earlier we were talking who were involved in the trade. Uh, so, we were talking that Romans had an important role and other traders. There is another beautiful poem, Purana 123. It talks about the uh, involvement of Cheras in maritime trade or protection of ship. ship. So, it says, Sinamithu Thanai Vanavan, Kudagadal Polandar Navai. Again, look at the term Polam. Polandar Navai. Navai is a ship. Oti Avadi. Piragalam uh, which means in the passage of the western sea where Vanavan with angry army Sinamil Tanin drove the Navai that offers gold or metal. That means probably Cheraki put a restriction wherever this Navai of goes, no other ship should go. Probably this was to prevent piracy, we have reference to piracy near the port of Musari in Greek or Roman text. This particular poem very interestingly places Cheras uh, as you know driving or controlling some of the uh, watercrafts. Again, it is open to interpretation. Again, we need to look at it very critically. Ayurveda Mahadevan mentioned when there is a reference to the name 
Kocha Kuman at Bernike, he said probably he, was, he belonged to the royal line, but again we do not know whether we can interpret in such a way. But this particular poem is very uh, important. Next. Finally, I am coming to the spatial dimension. This is where we are coming to the material culture site uh, or spatial aspect of sites, landscape, networks, and uh, hinterlands. So, this is that we need to see uh, the concept of landscape, how the networks linked cultures and how it connected cultures. These networks were very important for these uh, trade activity and uh, we have uh, evidence of that. Yeah, ports, market and settlements and network aside cannot be seen in isolation. It should be seen as part of the landscape. So therefore, we cannot see Patanam as something on its own, it was connected. There is a connected history, connectivity that matters. Uh, this is where Sanjay Subramanian says that connected history. So we need to see the broader connection. We cannot see that Patnam became something important just because of the local connection. Yes, true. Uh, the spices were important. At the same time, Patnam had a strong hinterland with East Coast, Bengal, Bay of Bengal, and uh, Southeast Asia and uh, some settlements were special. This is where you know we need to look into the terminology. Why Patanam? Because we have referenced Patanam all across India. We have Prapas Patan and Kaveri Pumpatinam, Vishakapatinam, several settlements and there were certain special category of settlements where there existed market where there existed material, cultural or industrial production. Uh, we get clear um, reference in Artha Sastra to Patanam. So uh, definitely these were some of the uh, important settlements. Again, Patanam was not standalone. It was linked with the hinterland and network communities, hunter gatherers, producers, specialists and manufacturers. Uh, and there were also consumers. We cannot underestimate the consumers in southern India and uh, some of these people really were consuming the goods produced at Pachanam and uh, the mountain landscape and the eastern Indian uh, ocean. They were important. Right? Yeah, why we call them as early urban centers? Because they had planned settlement, bricks, roof tiles, evidence of script, industrial activity. Shell, copper, gold, glass, beads, textile, they functioned as markets. They also had political formation and imported uh, ceramics. And next. So these were the important settlements, you know, how uh, these settlements like Arikamedia, Kaveri, Kumbatina, uh, Kotkai, Kundi on the west coast, you know, all these were the important settlements and we call them as main nodes that connected. Because in any kind of geographical, human geography or cultural geography, you know that certain settlements acted as nodes and they connected. Next. So, this is the map showing some of the important coastal ports and settlements. And the location of certain ports have not been identified probably. They are lost. Next. You can see Pachanam uh, and Kochi and all that. Now we are at Kochi. So this represents a kind of node of a different period. So these settlements shift, the nodes shift over a period of time. Uh, and uh, these are some of the important uh, sites. You can see Madura, Madurai and Kiladi and Arahankulam. And probably the uh, road existed and connecting Kochi. Similarly, Kodumanal, I have not marked Kodumanal on this map. Kodumanal was also an important area. And uh, all these coastal centers emerged primarily after 1st century BC. You get voluminous material culture, whatever I showed now. Next. Here you see some of the hinterland sites in Tamil Nadu where you find brick architecture and all that. Next. So, locus of exchange. Already uh, I mentioned sometime there is a reference to the name Avanam, Kodi Nudang Avanam. Sometimes these shops had a flag uh, and also, as I said earlier, you know, Niyamam and uh, Patanam. So they had some kind of settlement, uh, some kind of settlement. Uh, there were certain specialized markets or port centers 
Patanam was probably both port center and uh, market. And when you look at the literature, you get reference to the settlement categories like Silbudi, Peru. So the settlement categories are mentioned. Madam Peru. So this term is referred only in the context of city. Sometimes, interestingly, these cities are or towns are compared to women. Very interestingly, that occurs in the Sangam uh, literature. So the concept of balam or well is always used in the concept uh, in the context of these larger uh, uh, settlements like the inter interland of Chera country. So you cannot see Chera country or the ports in isolation. They were connected. They were connected by trade routes, people and movement. So uh, we have evidence for locally produced goods. Sometimes raw material came from elsewhere, Gujarat and Bayamutur or Congo region and other parts of India. Uh, next, coming to this uh, maritime exchanges, we understand that the overseas traders and local traders work together. The ro uh, role of Chera, uh, Chera vendors or king is something very important. Uh, and uh, the maritime trade was exchanges were multi-dimensional in nature, ideas, knowledge, tradition, for example, script, technology and people also medicine. Medicine is one area where we are not looking at. Sometimes these commodities that were uh, you know, used were meant to be used as medicine. People had ailments and they were trying to use the knowledge of other communities and uh, nutrition, food. Food is something important. So, these kind of exchanges might have happened. Unfortunately, everything is not written in the literature and everything is not preserved in uh, archaeological context. So, we need to sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, link and connect these uh, evidences. And also, West Coast was strategically important. In the, it was the center of the Indian Ocean Network, mainly South India and Sri Lanka. And more particularly, West Coast and Sri Lanka, they linked the multiple maritime routes of the Indian Ocean and beyond. And we should see Patanam and the really developments in the coast of Kerala in this, this perspective. And the maritime trade has been an important aspect. Maritime trade and exchange and movement and borrowing of ideas have been an important factor in the development of Kerala history as we see all along from the early medieval and later period uh, and uh, the strategic location was very important. Similarly, Kerala was you know, connected with multiple uh, directions. So, finally to conclude, uh, as I said, you know, the Chera country was linked with the afro eurasian world and its strategic location, monsoon winds, supported these activities local spice well and resources as well as uh, you know functioning as a transshipment locus for Indian Ocean exchanges contributed to the uh, importance of uh, Cheranadu or uh, Kerala and uh, community participation as I said the hunter gatherers and specialized traders uh, was very important. So multiple modes of production and exchanges reciprocal and bullion and uh, base and uh, metal mining and water, it existed at different level. We need to see similarly the production was diverse and uh, metal money was used as a matter of convenience and uh, after 300 CE probably there was a decline but not uh, disappearance. So the overseas market and demand, they were the uh, important uh, external factors for the uh, importance of this particular uh, exchange network developing in Kerala in the early historic period. Finally, I would like to remember uh, Dr. Roberto Tomber who has been with us identifying uh, uh, important amphora. Unfortunately, she passed away. And uh, I would next, uh, I would like to thank RD Archives, Elias and uh, Mohammed and also KCHR Bama actually and Shajan and Stephen Sai Bodham and other people who have uh, helped me uh, in the presentation. Thank you.